I would now like to ask our panelists for their questions to Professor McQueen. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Jenkins. I particularly look impressed by the care with which you distinguish based on levels of evidence, if you will, <clears throat> evidence from sights and sounds about explosions, and then separating that from evidence about the cause of these explosions and the explosives. I think that's a very constructive kind of analysis. Could you tell us something more about how the evidence for the cause, that the cause of these explosions is indeed explosives? Right. Um, I'm going to use three categories that seem to me to be important. I call them identification, force, and pattern. The first is probably the weakest, but it's still worth mentioning. This is identification. Namely that most of my witnesses are firefighters with experience in fires, and they do not identify the explosions that they encounter as any of the, as belonging to the four categories. If they thought it was a smoke explosion, perhaps they'd say so. If they thought it was a blevy, a boiler exploding, perhaps they'd say so. I find in the 10,000 pages of the oral histories a few little references. Well, when, it, when one man says, it was like an ex smoke explosion on a tremendous scale was going on. Or someone else might say, I saw a bunch of flashes. Could have been electrical, I guess. They're very tentative and very, very few. So the first point is they don't identify them as belonging to those categories. The second is more important, I think, and it's called force. According to the sources I have read, there is no way any of those kinds of explosions could have torn apart these massive buildings. According to NIST, these buildings were essentially intact below the point where they were hit by the planes. These were extremely strong buildings. You cannot blow them apart with smoke explosions. You cannot blow them apart with any of the four, according to what I've read. Now, I stand to be corrected if someone has different evidence. Not only could they not be blown apart, they could not be blown apart in the way in which we see these buildings brought down which is with extreme pulverization, massive force, hurling beams, you know, great distances, and so on. And r uh, let me just stress that many, many eyewitnesses are very clear about the fact that they're not just seeing explosions, they're seeing them tear the building apart. And then finally, third, pattern. I find no evidence that any of these four kinds of explosions would create the distinctive pattern that we see I'm uh, sorry, that the eyewitnesses say that they saw. Regular energetic events coming down at uh, regular time intervals. And that, I believe, is why NIST, when it has to deal with these ejections, tries to come up with a hypothesis which doesn't involve any kind of explosion. They try to say it's air pressure in the tower. And they do that, I believe, because they know that if those are explosions, they have to come from explosives and they have to have been planted. So the, the account that says that as the towers collapsed, the compression of air uh, caused these ejections at lower levels, you're ruling out because the pattern of them, the timing of them, is earlier than when any compression could have caused that. Is that correct? That is one of the reasons why I rule it out. There are two variations on that hypothesis. Back when in the pancake hypothesis days, they said, NIST said, well, actually, I guess this is pre-NIST, so maybe this was FEMA, I don't remember. In any case, the common explanation was that as the floors pancaked, they caused these ejections. Later, when the pancake hypothesis was given up by NIST, what, were, what, what did they have? They had nothing. So they claimed that the top part of the towers acted as a piston, right. and that the rest of the tower was like a, a tube, and the piston in the tube. I don't think that stands up to even mo the most rudimentary examination. And I do want to point to uh, Kevin Ryan in the corner, who wrote a very fine article on these ejections a few years ago, which in my view pretty much 
ends the discussion. Do you think that what you've seen in these testimonies, uh, in the, excuse me, in the witness reports, does it lead you to think that the, the peripheral columns must have been uh, set with explosions? Can you tell whether these things, these injections, emanate from the edge of the building or from the center of the building? I don't really want to go there. Okay. I, I don't know enough about demolition. The only thing I'll say is that the idea that this is caused by pressure in the building, I, I know that's not what you're asking now, okay. but, but I want to say this anyway, and, and that the ejections came from the windows is clearly false because if we analyze frame by frame, the video that I showed you there, it's pretty clear that some of these focused ejections are coming directly from the corner, and that means there were no windows in the corner. They were coming through the aluminum cladding and probably between the um, perimeter columns, but I don't want to say more than that. Finally, let me acknowledge that you're doing much more than taking a poll, but uh, a, a witness of, of testimonies here, but how many records individual records did you scan to produce the 156 positive reports? Uh, it's easy to answer that in the case of the FDNY oral histories, a little bit harder in the other cases. That's why that's such an important group of material, because you could talk about percentages and what's representative and so on. So the FDNY oral histories have statements from approximately 500 members of the FDNY. And of the 500, we can say 118 mention explosions. And that becomes especially significant when you realize that, almost without exception, they were not asked about explosions in the interview. They volunteered that. It's oh, just one more statement. It's difficult to do that kind of analysis with the other material. I understand. Dr. Jones. I'm very interested in the process by which eyewitness testimony is uh, transformed or recanted over time. Um, I wonder if you've had a chance to look at that process, and uh, the question is, how to, what is the mechanism by which this transformation occurs? Is it, does it appear to be systematic? Is it something that is uh, more amorphous that comes through the press? Uh, is, this a, is this kind of a, a, a contrived process, or is it sort of random? Right. It's a good question that I can't answer very well. From time to time we get, we hear claims that the firefighters, for example, were told not to talk about explosions. But I have no, I, I haven't, frankly, I haven't done the research. So I can't say if that's true. So what I've seen would fall under the category of amorphous. It's clear when I read the firefighters' testimonies that they were aware of the structural failure hypothesis, and not just aware that it was out there, but aware that it had some kind of imprimatur as the truth. And especially the pancake hypothesis, which was the main one being promulgated by the press during those early months, they referred to it repeatedly. Professor Lee. Uh, I would like to follow up on uh, Professor Johnson. Um, because early on you said um, you talked about Paul and Mose being approached by an architect and then uh, the architect saying no you didn't see that mm -hmm. and so that suggests that insiders were on the scene walking around you know and trying to you know engage in damage controls so it's pretty it, intriguing you know just exactly who was this architect? Yeah, it's a very good question.